This podcast is presented by GoDaddy.com. Keep an eye out for a special offer during this podcast. Here we go. I'm gonna show you what I know. Break it free from the mainstream, the studio machine. I want it my way. Indie film nation. I want it my way. Indie film nation. Going all the way. Indie film nation. You know it's gotta be. Indie film nation. Sue Lawson here for Indie Film Nation, and joining me today, we are really honored to have the editor of um, many, many films, including one that might be considered a little controversial here at Sundance this year, and that's by people who have not seen it. We'll see whether or not they still consider it to be controversial afterwards. It's entitled Zoo. Thanks for joining us today, Joe. Oh, you're quite welcome. Tell me a little bit, I don't want to talk a lot about the movie, but I'd like to talk about Thought I'd like to, but for, for this purpose right now, I'd like to talk about the editing process. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of walk me through and, and maybe touch a little bit upon Zoo and tell me how perhaps your editing process differs, if it does at all, from when you're doing other documentaries? Well, actually, I'm most often a narrative editor. And so I would say that in this case, well, documentaries and narrative are fairly different in general. Uh, the way that we dealt with this documentary, though, is probably different than most documentaries and different than the one previous one that I've done. Uh, in this case, we did all the interviews, audio interviews, beforehand, but there was no footage shot. And that's because of the nature of the material. It was such that people were not willing to be on camera. So we had a lot of audio interviews. We went through them and put together kind of an audio script of what it was that we were going to do. And at that point, we put together a shot list or just in general visuals inspired by the audio interview that we were going to shoot to make the movie. And so the movie is very representational and as opposed to being sync sound and, and talking heads and things, we don't have talking heads. It's much more of a Terrence Malick kind of look to it, effect to it. And happily, the press has actually compared it that way, which I'm pleased about. Um, can you talk a little bit about the workflow? Well, in this case, we we uh, shot on film, and, and it's, it was uh, Super 16, and we telecined that to a 2K uh, telecine so that we had very high-resolution images, which we were going to then uh, color correct and do a film out eventually with a process called dig a digital intermediate. And so the whole thing, once it's scanned as, as, uh, it, as computer images, it's never, we're never going to go back to the negative. We don't cut negative. Uh, so once we scanned it as 2K, then we down-resed down it, down-converted it to HD, DVC Pro HD 1080p. And that's what I did my editing on. And I edited on this laptop right here, a, a MacBook Pro uh, with two two gigabytes of, of memory, and it's the fastest MacBook Pro you can get right now. And I had about a terabyte or two of disk storage to put all that on. And I used mostly FireWire 800, although as it turns out, the 400 can do all right as well. And just cut pretty much in HD, did a whole bunch of color correction and things because my director's very picky about the image. So even before going to official color correction, he really can't even look at the image until it's been color corrected to his tastes, which are pretty much uh, green and blues, more blues than anything. So since we had the Telecine, which was straight out of, uh, totally uncolor corrected, it had a lot of reds and normal colors that you would see, and that's not his speed. <laughs> well, a lot of the color, I'm assuming, has to do with the mood that he's trying to set for whatever subject matter it is that he's going into at the time. That's absolutely true, but he is very, he leans towards the blues and greens. So for instance, there was a, there's a shot or a sequence at the end of the film that he originally color corrected to blue and green. And I pointed out that it was supposed to be um, a warm tropical place and somewhere very far away from where the rest of the things took place. And he was like, oh yeah, I guess maybe it would be a good idea to lean a little warmer. So 
um, it's it's a, it's a it's a very interesting collaboration with with a director in general, and and this particular director, Robinson Devore, is very hands on in the edit room. So we spend a lot of time, both of us there, just working away, and and him looking and and me cutting, and it's it's kind of like we're both directors in in that room. Just like if you're on set, then it's the director and the director of photography that are kind of co-directing the film. Well, you're a director in your own right as well. Do you feel that that enhances what you're able to bring to the table as far as editing a piece like Zoo? Very much so, yeah. I, I, um, I really enjoy telling a good story, and I'm very focused on the audience being able to understand the material and yet at the same time not being ahead of the movie. So I think a great deal of editing is in the pacing and the way that you impart the information to the audience such that you're a little bit ahead but not so far ahead that they disengage. And that's something that I contribute a great deal to in the editing room. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between working in the narrative format and working in the doc format? Well, for one thing, uh, in the doc format, the biggest thing in this documentary was, and I guess in any, is that you have the words, the building blocks that you're given. Um, the people say what they say, and you have to make a coherent story out of it. You're not writing a script. You don't get to revise the script and things like that. And the shots, well, in this film, the shots that I had really were storyboarded and things. So visually, this was like a narrative film. Mm -hmm. But in the audio and in the way that we were really imparting the story, we had these audio interviews from a number of different people and weaving that together and f deciding what, import, what uh, information to impart when was very different than having a script and being able to just say, here's what the words are going to be. We had the words we had. What did you think were some of the greater challenges that you faced when it came to this? Time. Time and money, uh, which I guess Those is... Those are always the challenges. Yes, it's very, very common. Uh, we had to put this together in about three to four months, right in there. And the director is a perfectionist. He wants it to be spot on and he's not a person to compromise. And so mostly we had to stretch the time and the way that I stretched the time is is I ended up working about 18 hours a day, seven days a week for upwards of two months in order to make it more like five or, five or six months instead of three or four months. How that wonderful time travel. Um, we were talking before about how much footage you had to work with, and it was like 23 hours worth of footage, is that right? Somewhere between 23 and 25, yes. Challenges when it came to, to dealing with that much footage, or is that pretty typical for what you are used to dealing with when it comes to either a narrative or a doc? That's pretty typical for me. Uh, it, seems to, it seems to come in right around there. The thing that was challenging this time and different for me is that I hadn't before edited a long-form piece using HD. And there's just a lot of data. And so in this case, just moving the data around took a long time. And storing the data and, and doing the backups and all that stuff. We, we actually ran into one problem at one point where we had a corrupt QuickTime file. And so there was probably a frame somewhere that was wrong. And most of the QuickTime file would probably have been fine. But QuickTime has a checksum in something or something in there. And it wouldn't let me see any of it. And so I had this whole reel of film, essentially, this whole telecine that I couldn't see. And, and I had run the backups, and I didn't realize that the file was corrupted. So it backed up right over my good copy. And I ended up having to go and, and recapture, not retelecine, but recapture from the HD master um, that, that whole section. And that was unfortunate. It took a lot of time. Time away from the creative process? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, there's all sorts of, of um, little gotchas along the way that take away from the creative process. And there are facts of life. Um, some of them are limitations in Final Cut. Some of them are where maybe I wasn't doing as studious backups as I should have been. But uh, there, there are certainly, there's a lot of mechanical work that goes in. And happily for a period of time, I had some assistant editors who helped immensely in logging footage. I mean, if you don't log your interviews scrupulous, scrupulously, you lose them. So we had extensive transcripts and we could search for whatever we wanted to. And as long as we had that, we were in very good shape. In the beginning, we didn't have that. And going through the tapes, 
with Rob saying, oh, I remember that there was this particular thing somewhere around here. And he's like, oh, and I think it was five minutes later. No, maybe a little bit earlier. That was... Agonizing. Yes. <laughs> that was a very slow march. And if we had continued in that vein, we never would have finished. Now, this is not your first film here at Sundance. That's true. Uh, two years ago, I had a film here called Police Beat, which was by the same set of people. Uh, I was the editor along with Mark Winitsky. And... Uh, Rob DeVore was the director, and Sean Kirby was our fantastic cinematographer, both this time and last time. And that was received very well, got a limited distribution, and is going to be coming out on DVD soon. It's a, a fairly similar feeling movie, although that one is a, is a narrative as opposed to a documentary, and it doesn't have anywhere near as controversial a subject matter. Can we talk a little bit about Zoo, just a little bit? Just a little bit. Okay. Um... Do you want to give a brief synopsis of the story? Well, it's hard to give a brief synopsis without really getting into the meat of the thing. No pun intended. <laughs> Zoo is a film about a man who, well, Zoo is about a, a number of, uh, sort of a subculture in a sense, of people who are zoophiles, and that's a psychological term, which means people who have a love relationship with animals other than their own species. So it's pretty risque territory, but we don't treat it that way. We treat it in a very um, respectful and non-sensationalized uh, manner. And all the reviews that have been coming out, which have been wonderful, I might add, uh, and I'm very grateful to them, have have commented on how it's amazing that you can take a subject like this and make a tasteful film out of it. Uh, but anyway, what happened was that these, there was this community who was doing this for quite a few years. I don't know exactly how long. And then one of the members of that community did something a little reckless, I suppose, and ended up dying from what they had done. Uh, the The interaction that they had had with a particular horse. And that resulted in the police and the media <clears throat> and everything finding out about this community and basically running them out of town on a rail and making a great deal of fun of them and things like that. And we thought that we certainly didn't condone what had happened or we didn't really want to comment one way or the other, but we did think that the media coverage was very one-sided, and we wanted to see what it would be like to cover such, to talk about the film and actually give a more full examination of the story and the people involved. And so that's what we did, and I think we're successful in it. Well, the subject matter is controversial, yeah. is, can be considered shocking. How do you as an editor keep from sensationalizing it? Well, um, you decide what you want to focus on. I mean, you decide what, what is the substance of the story along, you know, the director and everybody. We, we talk about it and figure out what it, is, what it is that we're trying to impart to the audience. And document, documenting how the mechanics of this thing was really not part of that. And so once we had decided that, it really wasn't very hard to avoid a sensational movie. The harder part was to make a movie that was not dull and that was beautiful. And I, th we, I believe that we managed to do that. Now, your next film, what are you working on now? Well, I was working on this film up until... <laughs> Tuesday? Uh, <laughs> up until Wednesday at 6.30, and then picked up the tape from the post house at midnight, and then was on a plane at 9.30 in the morning. So I haven't really had a lot of time to work on anything <laughs> other than this and talking to you folks. And I appreciate that as well. Can we talk a little bit more about the workflow? Um, different editors have different styles of working. I know that some will almost do a storyboard as far, as far as post-it notes are concerned so they can move them around, decide what they're putting where. Others are much more of a, let me take a look at everything, and then the story will kind of, reveal itself to me the way I want to put it together. What is your preferred method? Well, I do like to take a look at everything. And in fact, I'm one of, the, one of those few editors that likes to be on set when we're shooting. Now, in this case, I wasn't due to time and things. Um,
but for my previous narrative films, I like to be the boom op. And so I get to really watch the performances and see what's coming in. And I do f seem to be fairly able to divorce myself from the um, attachment to various shots and things like that. So once I know the material, that either being by ingesting it all and watching it, or by being there and seeing it, a combination of the two, then um, of course you start with the script, although in this case we didn't have one, but in general I would start with the script and, and see if it seems like we've got in shooting what was important to tell the story in the script. And you may or you may not. And if you don't, then you say, okay, well, this scene isn't providing this function. And, and you see what scenes, I make a spreadsheet. And I make a spreadsheet of the scenes that I have and what their emotional function is and what their plot function is, how they're, how they're moving things along. Also a little bit of the, um, in, in there, a little bit of the, the pacing, the, the, how the speed of the thing is. And so I look at my, my uh, outline, essentially, in the spreadsheet, and I see if it's working, if it really is telling the story and if it's balanced and things. And I'll put together an assembly edit based on that, and then you watch it. And when you're cutting together any given scene, you can pretty much feel the flow of it. Any given scene is a little like a short film. I mean, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end, you hope. You have a conflict in the beginning, and hopefully it gets resolved in one way or another by the end of the scene, and there's a, there's a pacing to it. So I put together each of the scenes and get them to feel right. Then I put them together in an assembly and watch it and see how it feels. And from there, I, I keep a little tape recorder with me, and as I'm watching it, I just make notes to myself. And then I'll go through and adjust things based on those notes. And that's my iterative approach. Now, when you inject the director into that, then he has somewhat of a different approach. This particular director likes to really focus on particular areas of the film and a particular scene or even a transition between two shots. And we may spend a very, very long time right in there looking at that. That makes me a little nervous because I want to make sure the overall flow of it works well. But in doing that and then me getting to go and look at the overall film um, and see how the pacing is and him looking at the overall film and seeing how the pacing is and how it all feels, we get a notion for it and often we'll say, okay, well, this is the way it was written or this is the way we have it at the moment, but I think this whole chunk of the film needs to be over here or this scene, which was practically at the end of the movie, we can move to to the first third of the movie or something and find find various places to put things. So it's rare, I'd say, that a film ends up being structured the same way as the original script. And in fact, in all the narrative films that I've done so far, the ending has never been the ending that was written. So the film that you end up with is never the film that you started out, or at least it's not the film that was originally delivered to you? Well, I think a film is written a number of times. It's written when the script is written. It's written when it's uh, played out. Well, it, it's written again when it's storyboarded, mm -hmm. for one thing, and the DP and the director work on it. It's written again when it's shot because there's things that are gotten and things that aren't gotten. There are decisions that are made on set of um, we don't have time to get this shot or let's, get, let's change this, this particular scene to work like this. And the ramifications of some of that may not be really known right there, but later on you'll find out. And then so the third and final time that the film is written is in the editing room. Well, you can check out my work at, um, at Police Beat. I think it's policebeatmovie.com. And also uh, you can Google me on, uh, you can Google me, I guess, in general. Or IMDb. Uh, or IMDb. I have an, a bunch of shorts which are nowhere near as impressive as this. And then there's, <laughs> there's Police Beat, which is a feature, and there's The Naked Proof, which is a feature. And there's another feature coming out soon. And there's another feature called Borrowing Time, which is a really interesting black and white homage to Buck Rogers and that era. And it's, it's by a, a fellow named Webster Kroll, who is an incredible animator. Here's a, that's a good person to, to Google. Uh, I think his website is Panic Button Pictures, or just Panic Button. Panic Button. Yeah, and very talented guy. So 
I think that's about it. Cool. Anything that I didn't ask you that you would like for me to have asked you? Um, what about all the what about all the people that don't get credits? That, that... <laughs> what about them? <laughs> okay. Well, there's. I mean, editors usually don't get a lot of a lot of limelight, though. I'm getting more this time than than I have in the past, and and I'm grateful for that. But there are some people, like my assistant editor David Parker, who is not going to get any any um, buzz at all. And I can tell you that he was terrific, and I couldn't done it, have done it without him. And then, most importantly for me, my my girlfriend Alicia Dara, who put up with having us edit this whole film in our apartment, in my studio, which is in our apartment, and have have it practically be crew headquarters for three months, which was quite disrupting to both of our lives. And I'm very grateful to her for putting up with me and the whole thing. I think that's great. Thanks again, Joe. I really appreciate the time that you spent with us. Thank you. Going all the way, Indie Film Nation, you know it's got to be.